and welcome to the podcast Welcome Presidency, our podcast on Germany's AU Council Presidency. My name is Susanna Conrad. I'm a senior program manager for security and foreign affairs of the multinational policy development dialogue of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels. Furthermore, this podcast is part of our new online seminar series, Future Dialogue on Libya, which we are jointly launching with our regional program, Political Dialogue Southern Mediterranean, based in Tunis. In the upcoming weeks, we will hold regular online discussions with experts on Libya's future towards the inner Libyan developments, multiple security initiatives by the international community, and potential scenarios of a transition of Libya. In the first podcast, we would like to take a critical look at the current AU actions with regards to Libya and to Germany's role in a Libyan conflict resolution in the course of its AU Council presidency. Therefore, I invited my colleague Thomas Volk to a short conversation on these issues, who is leading our regional program in Tunis and publishes, among other various things, a monthly newsletter on inner Libyan developments called Inside Libya. We are linking the newsletter's page in the description of this podcast. Well, Thomas, thank you very much for taking your time today for a first exchange about the future of Libya mainly with a view on the EU's comprehensive approach towards its crisis management for this country, which the EU itself frames as a strong support for the UN-led peace process. So what is the EU's common approach at present? Following the first Berlin conference on Libya in January this year, the EU resumed more actions towards Libya and launched its new CCDP mission, Active Surveillance Operation Irini, with the aim of implementing the arms embargo imposed by the United Nations Security Council. AU Active Surveillance Operation Irini is a key piece in the patchwork of AU CSDP missions and operations in support of Libya. This includes AU NAFOR Operation Sophia, the EU Integrated Border Assistance Mission for Libya, whose mandate has been extended until June 2021, and the AU Liaison and Planning Cell. In addition, the EU is also the largest donor of humanitarian aid to Libya through the so-called Trust Fund Libya to protect migrants, support communities, and integrated border management. Last but not least, recently it became public that the EU is considering a military mission in Libya after the EU High Representative for Foreign and Security Affairs, Josef Borrell, visited Libya in early September. And finally, the EU also imposed sanctions against violations of the UN arms embargo. This all sounds like a lot of actions and support to me. So my first question is, Thomas, how do you evaluate the current EU actions towards Libya? What can the EU do better in your opinion? And where do you see a more realistic role for the EU in the UN-led peace process? Thank you very much, Susanna, for initiating this podcast and for these uh, very interesting first questions. So I think it is, first of all, important to state that the EU, after all, is more assertive than generally thought when it comes to Libya and that there is a European engagement in this Libyan crisis even though many observers and experts on Libya would constantly criticize the role the European Union plays in this conflict. You mentioned the recent EU sanctions against those who breached the UN arms embargo against Libya. And during a recent visit of the newly appointed and accredited EU ambassador to Libya just uh, some days, a few days ago. He also mentioned again in a meeting with Prime Minister Saraj in Tripoli that these sanctions will really take restrictive measures against those who undermine and obstruct the work on different tracks of the Berlin process. 
including on the implementation of the UN arms embargo at, on Libya, as well as those who work against ongoing attempts to reform the security authorities, continue to plunder state funds or commit human rights abuses and violations all over the country. So there we clearly do see an assertive EU that not only announces, but really also takes actions when it comes to Libya. Furthermore, the EU ambassador also clearly stated that, for example, the Libya-Turkey Memorandum of Understanding that was signed earlier this year is against the law of sea, against international law, and will not be accepted by third parties or EU member states, which I think is also a very relevant information to bring to the table here. And you mentioned rightly that the EU is also very active when it comes to the integrated border and migration management project, which is part of the EU's comprehensive range of actions to assist Libya to better manage migration in line with international standards and with the objective to save lives, protect those in need and fight trafficking in human beings and a migrant smuggling. And it is very true, and I think it cannot be emphasized enough, that Libya remains the biggest beneficiary of the European Trust Fund on Africa, with a total value of 455 million euros in programs um, and with substantial funding going, for example, to the protection of migrants and refugees and alongside the actions for border management. So there, I think we see a broad variety of the EU and it is important to do so because we should not forget that Libya is in the direct neighborhood to the European Union and um, that together with the mission Irini, of course, there is something happening when it comes to the UN arms embargo, when it comes to a border protection, but of course, there should be done more. So the second part of your question was also what the EU should do better. And I think here and in this context, it is very important to, to really, let's say, call for a broader geostrategical understanding of the Libyan crisis. So the European Union first and foremost should understand that European interests can and should be formulated when it comes to the European neighborhood policy and precisely now to the Libyan crisis. And we do not only have the concerns when it comes to irregular migration or security issues in the context of Libya, but as mentioned, there is a broader geostrategical dimension of this Libyan conflict. Russia and Turkey, are already in Libya and try to really influence and settle the scene according to their realpolitik interests, if you want. Both Russia and Turkey aim to have maritime bases in Libya, meaning in the Mediterranean and meaning in the direct vicinity of the European Union. And I think it is important to ask the question if this is really in the European interest or not. Furthermore, Libya is not just any North African country. It is the country with the biggest gas and oil supplies on the African continent. And of course, this is directly, again, part of the Libyan crisis, thinking of natural resources, thinking of oil and how this economically became part of the Libyan conflict as well. And as a last point, maybe uh, in this um, context, the EU should formulate its uh, European interests more, uh, let's say, um, louder internationally, become a proactive actor to stand for human rights, to freedom and rule of law and stick to the ambition that the European Commission formulated um, earlier 
this year and also after uh, Ursula von der Leyen became president of the European Commission, namely to really be a geopolitical commission and to have a geopolitical approach to European interests. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, as I see, you agree that the EU is doing a lot in Libya and for Libya, but also because Libya is in direct neighborhood to Europe. You call also for a broader geopolitical role of the European Union. But my question is all the time, how can the EU achieve this? Well, one of the weaknesses the EU is accused of in its foreign and security policy is its difficult decision making. After all, 27 member states must be consulted and encouraged to find a compromise. That sounds very complicated and it is because the national interests of the EU individual member states playing a very significant role. With regard to Libya, two European member states in particular are accused of blocking peace efforts around Libya because of overriding national interests. We are talking about Italy and France, which the media attests as shadow war for influence and oil in Libya. As it looks, the EU would have to position itself between Italy and France. In parallel, there is the issue of how Germany positions itself as a mediator in the Libyan peace process. Here I am primarily, primarily concerned with Turkey's role in Libya and the controversial opinions between Germany and France on Turkey. This brings me to my next question. How do you view the various roles of EU member states in the geopolitical conflict realms around Libya? How can such different interests within EU member states be unified towards Libya? So what could be a solution in your eyes? Well, first of all, I think it's important and quite positive to note that uh, Germany plays an important role when it comes to uh, the peaceful solution of this uh, Libyan crisis and in finding such a peaceful and especially political solution to this crisis. As you mentioned in your introductory words, Germany initiated together with the United Nations the Berlin Conference on Libya in January this year, gathered uh, different stakeholders to come together to speak about how to continue with the Libyan um, crisis and find a political solution. And in the final declaration of the Berlin Conference, which by the way has 55 points and targets very different uh, chapters like the arms embargo, which we talked about, but also looks at a security sector reform, looks at an economic reform. There again, we speak, uh, speak of course about the oil wealth of the country. But in one very important uh, phrase, the participants of the Berlin Conference state, and I quote, we reaffirm our strong commitment, commitment to the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, and national unity of Libya. Only a Libyan-led and Libyan-owned political process can end the conflict and bring lasting peace." End of the quotation. This, I think, is very important because it gives the sovereignty and the responsibility, if you want, to the Libyan people, as it should be a Libyan-led and Libyan-owned political process. And again and again, it is Germany that really brought this conference to the table, and the German foreign minister was also in Libya recently, as was the high representative Borrell at the beginning of September. And all participants, and especially Italy and France, the two you mentioned, agreed on this Berlin process declaration, which is why it is even more astonishing, to be honest, that after the Berlin process, different developments started. We saw Italy, by the way, the former colonial power of Libya and the only EU country that until today has its embassy in Tripoli. Most of the other countries would work from Tunis or from somewhere else in the region, but Italy also during the time of, let's say, military actions in Tripoli was in uh, 
Libya present, and it shows the strong affiliation also to the country and which important role normally Italy could play also in finding a solution to this conflict. Of course, there is the interest of Italy when it comes to the reduction of the flux of irregular migration, because unsurprisingly, Italy uh, geographically would be highly, um, let's say, targeted by irregular migrants coming from sub-Saharan African countries, passing uh, Libya and then the Mediterranean and arriving in Italy. So the main interest of Italy when it comes to the Libyan crisis is to reduce the flux of irregular migrants, but there is also the interest of natural resources, of energy, of oil. Eni, the Italian company Eni, has a strong influence in Libya, and there would be some international observers that even claim that if you want to arrive or achieve something in Libya, uh, go through any because they are well connected and they would know most of the people. But uh, to really also um, have this argument for Italy, they of course support the UN recognized uh, government of national accord GNA um, with Prime Minister Savage and um, are not affiliated or supporting, for example, as France did in the past, Haftar, the self-declared warlord, uh, who uh, had more influence in the past than he has today, and who is the driving political figure in eastern Libya. Some would argue in the meanwhile, he's not that influential anymore as he was before. But France, surprisingly, for several months, supported Haftar, gave him an international floor, and therewith also excluded itself to some extent uh, on the diplomatic packet. At least this is heard if you speak with other European ambassadors working on Libya. So I think we should summarize Italy. Italy's main interest uh, is the migration topic. France's main interest is the security dimension of the whole conflict, also in regard to uh, the Islamist threat that of course is also for some observers a part of this Libyan crisis. But again, it must be understood, as I mentioned also before, that there is a broad geopolitical dimension to this crisis with the maritime security component, with the gas and natural resources component, and with the general question of uh, new centers of power in the region, thinking, for example, about the Turkey GNA Libya Accord when it comes to us, and on the other side, the accord between, for example, Greece and France that was now initiated uh, some months ago. So there is this uh, bigger picture that always uh, must be mentioned. Still, and these I think are positive signs, Italy, France and Germany called jointly for a ceasefire already on 25th of June this year, which then also was uh, officialized by an agreement between Sarraj and Aguila Saleh, the head of the House of Representatives based in Tobruk, which was then officially declared on the 21st of August. And we should also not forget that in mid-July already, Prime Minister Conte of Italy, President Macron of France and Chancellor Merkel of Germany announced in a joint declaration that they would encourage uh, sanctions against um, those who breached the embargo, which then finally also happened. So there is some initiative also of Germany, Italy and France that has its visible results, but still there would a stronger concerted EU foreign policy needed, not only on Libya, by the way, I think, but especially also in the Libyan context, to come up with a concerted and clearly understandable EU foreign policy and to avoid therewith to have several different actors speaking about the same topic. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think you very much highlighted in your remarks a Libyan-led process. So let us take a last look at Libyan actions from outside actors with a view on the current talks in Geneva 
where this week the Libyan conflict parties started a week-long round of talks. The military committee known as the Five Plus Five, with five representatives from each side in Libya, began its work after the Berlin-Libyan conference in January. The first talks in this format took place in Geneva in February. The hope is that the group will be able to negotiate that a government could be established in Libya in the coming weeks under UN mediation. Other Libyan delegations have also recently held political talks in Morocco and Egypt. Political talks in Tunisia are also planned for early November. Given these developments, the German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas expressed cautious optimism about this at the second Berlin conference recently. Do you see that similar? And can you please share with us your impressions on the ongoing talks in Geneva? The Geneva talks are very important, especially because many Libyans in the past month had the impression that the fate of Libya is not in their hands anymore, but determined in Ankara, Moscow or Cairo, which is why it is very important that now this intra-Libyan political dialogue process restarts and hopefully comes up with concrete results. So there are now these ongoing Geneva talks um, until the 24th of October in this five plus five format. And this five plus five joint military committee, the security track, if you want, is one of the three intra-Libyan tracks that UNSMIL, so the United Nations Support Mission in Libya, is working on along with the economic and political tracks, which emerged, as you rightly said, in the aftermath of the Berlin Conference. These tracks were endorsed by Security Council Resolution 2510, which called on both parties to reach an agreement for a permanent ceasefire. And um, so you have five actors from the GNA side, five uh, participants from the LNA side that meet now again on invitation of the United Nations in Geneva. And if you want, it is a next step in line of the political talks that were held in Montreux in early September and in Busnica uh, on 11th September, parallelly also in Cairo. And that led to the renewed Libyan political dialogue forum, which is a concrete outcome. And which by the way, was already foreseen in 2019 at some point, but then after Haftar announced that he would uh, conquer Tripoli in April 2019, it was stopped. And now it is a new, let's say, a way to start this very important Libyan political dialogue forums. But, and this is also something many Libyans would criticize, there are two big questions. How are the participants of the Libyan political dialogue forum selected? How can representativity be assured? And how can really all groups of the society, tribal actors, ethnical groups, regional actors, um, youth, women, all be involved to have an inclusive political dialogue process? I think this is the biggest question at the moment. And we will see if these five plus five talks at the end will really come up with a concrete um, declaration at the end. But these are crucial questions because one thing that was mentioned in the Montreux Accord, which was, by the way, moderated by the Humanitarian Dialogue on behalf of the United Nations, is that presidential and parliament elections should come up within the next 18 months, meaning until the end of 2021. On, and that's also very important, on the basis of an agreed constitutional framework. And there was also this declaration that Sirte, for example, should become the new capital once the security situation um, gives the opportunity to move there. But um, it is a very, at the moment, let's say, open period. We have these talks. There is a new dynamism. There were the Montreux, the Busnica talks, the Cairo parallel talks. Now they meet again in Geneva. But still many people in Libya do have the impression that the wrong participants are selected for these peace processes that they are not well enough informed about the idea and the outcome of these discussions and that even UNSMEL 
um, which for some is just seen as a support mission, would need a new and stronger mandate to really get more involved and have a stronger mandate to solve politically the Libyan crisis. And then, of course, Sarraj, GNN Prime Minister Sarraj announced that he might resign by the end of October. So this remains also very interesting to be seen how in the coming days and months the political developments in Libya continue. And for all of us, I think it is important once again to underline according to the Berlin process, that the Libyan-led and Libyan-owned political solution to this crisis is crucial, is important for Libya and the Libyans, by the way, also for the MENA region, for the neighbors of Libya, but especially and also for the European Union. And this is why I thank you a lot for the opportunity for this podcast today. Thomas, thank you very much for your kind words and uh, let's hope for an inclusive political dialogue and upcoming elections in Libya. Thank you also for being so specific and willing to share your thoughts on the EU activities and the EU member states towards Libya in the run up to our discussion series. Me personally, I'm very much looking forward to our first discussion on the future of Libya, um, which will take place on Wednesday, October 28 at 3 p.m. CET online. Thank you very much also to all our listeners. We will keep you updated and I wish you all a nice day. We invite you to listen and visit us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn or SoundCloud for more information. You can find all the links in the description. Please remember that we will publish more episodes during the next weeks. Thanks for your attention. Oh,